And today we're going to look at the uh, Madrid Alto de Fe of uh, 1680. And Alto de Fe was uh, essentially the, uh, the judgment at the end of uh, an Inquisition uh, trial. And uh, the Madrid Alto de Fe of 1680 was uh, probably the grandest that uh, occurred in Spain. And through this, we're also going to have a quick look at the, uh, what the Inquisition was and what was happening in, uh, in Europe around that time, because that is uh, fundamental to understanding the, uh, the Western Sephardic story. So uh, for most people these days, if, if you say the word Spanish Inquisition, this is what uh, comes to mind. But if we go back uh, 100 years in uh, Protestant countries, certainly it's, it's more likely to be something like this, the sort of uh, the so-called black legend. And this is uh, of the, uh, the evil Spanish Inquisition uh, uh, supposedly sort of killing uh, Native Americans and uh, feeding their children to the dogs. Uh, so obviously not, uh, not particularly uh, sympathetic. And this is actually the title of a book which was published uh, in London at, at uh, the same time as the, the Alto de Fe. It's called The Slaughterhouse, or a brief description of the Spanish Inquisition in a method never before used, in which is laid open the tyranny, insolence, perfidiousness, and barbarous cruelty of that tribunal. Um, it, it's worth remembering, of course, that in England at the same time, they were burning witches. So, um, but, but that's obviously how they uh, tried to see it. If, if you're an academic, um, please reach for your smelling salts, because we're about to sort of try and explain the Inquisition in about uh, two minutes. Um, an inquisition is a uh, tribunal of the church, which is uh, concerned about uh, ensuring doctrine is adhered to. So, but, so essentially they are against um, heresy, heretics. The inquisition took different forms and different times in uh, different countries. The, the Inquisition, which uh, evolved into the Spanish Inquisition, perhaps we can date back to uh, the Papal Bull of um, 1252. Uh, there were Inquisitions in uh, lots of different uh, European uh, countries and jurisdictions. Uh, England and Castile were, were notable exceptions to that. And in, in this, uh, this, this picture, we, we see the uh, Albigensian uh, crusade, and this was the uh, French king uh, attacking the Cathars, who had uh, religious views different from the Catholics. And in so doing, the uh, French crown uh, won control of much of what is now southern uh, France. On the other side of the Pyrenees, there had been a war going on between the uh, on and off between the uh, Muslims in the south and the Christians in the north for hundreds and hundreds of years, and the uh, Christians gradually uh, were winning out over the Muslims. And what this meant, as they won territory, uh, new territory, was that they acquired uh, Jews and uh, Muslims, and they had to decide what to do with these populations. Um, in some cases, they would. Uh, expel them. In other cases, they were forcibly baptized, which, to be fair, is actually against canon law, is against the, uh, the church law. And in other cases, people uh, voluntarily uh, chose to uh, be baptized, some because they believed uh, in the church teachings, and some just because they wanted to get on. And obviously, if you became a Christian, suddenly lots of uh, doors were open to you. You could, most obviously, you could uh, join the church. Uh, various professional careers were more open. You could uh, join uh, orders of chivalry. You could even join the, uh, the Spanish aristocracy. Um, and, th and this was largely resented by uh, many of the people whose families had always been Christians, who, who suddenly found themselves under competition. And this even led to, uh, to, to rioting and bloodshed. And the eventual solution to this was to declare two categories of Christian. Somebody whose family had always been Christian was called an old Christian, and somebody whose family uh, had been Jewish or Muslim and had converted was uh, called a new Christian. 
and surprise, surprise, these new Christians were then banned from uh, lots of jobs because they didn't have uh, the purity of blood, uh, so-called. And um, the, the Inquisition, uh, as, as we've seen, wasn't uh, in uh, Castile until uh, relatively late. The Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, petitioned the Pope in uh, 1478, and uh, an inquisition was established unusually under the authority of the crown rather than under the uh, authority of the church. And uh, this was important because the inquisition was one of the few national uh, institutions uh, within uh, Castile and Aragon, let's just call it uh, Spain for uh, simplicity. And uh, if, if we were just to take a snapshot of the country, we would see uh, royal estates, aristocratic estates, church estates, uh, various uh, monasteries, various towns with charters and, and, and so forth, but no sort of over, overriding um, central uh, control. And the first inquisitor general is this chap on the right, uh, Thomas de Torquemada, who himself had uh, some Jewish ancestry. So uh, Ferdinand and Isabella uh, completed their conquest uh, of the Iberian Peninsula by capturing Granada in uh, 1492. And they then had to decide what they were going to do with uh, all of these uh, Jews and Muslims and so forth, because they didn't necessarily know if the, uh, the Muslims would reinvade uh, from North Africa, if the, uh, the Jews would then support the Muslims, and also if the, uh, a major concern was that the unbaptized Jews, and the Inquisition had no authority over unbaptized Jews, would be a negative influence as they saw it on the uh, new Christians. And so as, as we know, the uh, answer to this question was the edict of expulsion uh, that we see on the right. And, and here we just see a, a map of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, under the Edict of Expulsion, people either had to, uh, Jews had to convert to Roman Catholicism or to leave. And uh, many converted, uh, in previous generations, many more had converted. Uh, but in 1492, uh, some, the ancestors of uh, what we now call the Western Sephardim, sort of historic communities of places like Amsterdam and uh, London, they uh, traveled uh, west into Portugal. Um, however, two years later, they were forced to convert in Portugal. So they became uh, new Christians within Portugal, although at that stage, Portugal had uh, no inquisition. And the uh, ancestors of what became uh, the Eastern Sephardim uh, moved into the Mediterranean. Some joined uh, established communities in North Africa. Others went to Italy, to the Ottoman Empire and beyond. Now, um, the expulsion of the Jews wasn't the only thing uh, to happen in uh, 1492. This is a uh, rather fanciful painting by the French artist Delacroix. I'm afraid I've, I've cut off the, um, the Catholic monarch's heads on the uh, far right. But, but this shows uh, Columbus uh, returning from the Americas. He, he thought he was going to the Indies, but he, he discovered America uh, instead. And here you can see him with a, a pile of, uh, of, of stuff which he had uh, brought back. He was trying to get to the uh, Indies to uh, find spices, but he found something that uh, was of even greater interest uh, to the Spanish crown, which were the uh, Aztec and the Inca empires with their great wealth in uh, gold and silver. And of course, then the Spanish empire uh, expanded elsewhere in the world. And a, a, a consequence of this, this money was uh, political and military power. So Spain became the leading military power uh, in Europe. And of course, they were fired up also with Catholic zeal having uh, defeated the Muslims. And, and here we see uh, towards the end of uh, Spain's glory days, uh, painted by Velasquez, of the uh, Dutch uh, surrendering to the Spanish army at uh, Breda. But um, everything 
eventually comes to an end. And uh, Portugal, which had been annexed by Spain in uh, 1580, the king of Portugal had uh, got himself killed uh, on crusade and had no heirs. Uh, Philip II of Spain, who in England we know for the uh, Spanish Armada, he had acclaimed the Portuguese throne. He also had a very large army and he uh, annexed uh, Portugal to the Spanish Empire. Uh, and various side effects um, happened from this. For example, the uh, Spanish uh, rivals, the Dutch, uh, moved into uh, Portuguese colonies. They uh, occupied part of uh, northeastern Brazil, which uh, is one of the things we'll discuss uh, next week, as well as Portuguese colonies uh, in East Asia. Uh, also, uh, the Inquisition largely uh, functioned on the money that it uh, confiscated from its victims. And the Spanish Inquisition, after the expulsion of the Jews and the you know, assimilation of, of new Christians over a few generations, had rather run out of victims and had uh, somewhat worn down. Whereas once the Inquisition had been introduced into Portugal, it, uh, it, it was really an, a very, very unpleasant and very busy institution. And so when Philip II uh, annexed Portugal in uh, 1580, an unexpected side effect was that uh, Spain was suddenly opened up to these uh, Portuguese new Christians, of course, many of whose grandparents, great grandparents had, had come from Spain in the first place. And the advantages of, of going to Spain were, were several, but first of all, the uh, Spanish Inquisition was uh, nowhere near as fierce as the Portuguese Inquisition. The Spanish economy was booming thanks to its colonies uh, in, in the Americas and elsewhere. Cities like uh, Seville and Madrid were expanding uh, very quickly. And also some of the wealthy uh, new Christians, uh, merchants from Portugal, acquired uh, national monopolies in Spain. For example, the, uh, the salt monopoly or the uh, tobacco monopoly, which I think is especially interesting for us, that uh, tobacco was, if you wanted to buy tobacco, it was a state monopoly, uh, but this was uh, farmed out to uh, an entrepreneur for a fixed sum of money. And this businessman would then uh, essentially uh, send people to all the small towns and, and cities and so forth in Spain to be sitting at uh, a kiosk uh, selling, selling this tobacco. And when the uh, asiento passed to uh, New Christians, they brought in uh, poorer New Christians from Portugal. Um, and, and so in... Uh, 1640, uh, Portugal declaring its uh, independence from Spain, although Spain didn't recognize it for another uh, 28 years, it was uh, an indication of uh, Spanish decline, but at the same time uh, for the uh, new Christians who had moved into Spain, that's to say people from Portugal of Jewish ancestry, they suddenly became sort of enemy aliens as well as their um, historic uh, ancestry. So um, not just uh, Portugal, uh, five days after the accession of uh, Louis XIV of France, the, the Sun King, the uh, previously invincible Spanish tercios, their, their military units, were um, heavily defeated by the French at the Battle of uh, Rocroi. And then later, um, Louis XIV here looking rather well-dressed on, on a battlefield in the uh, Spanish Netherlands, uh, today more or less Belgium, uh, defeated um, the Spanish yet again. So the Spanish were going from being the uh, preeminent power to uh, being very much on the back foot. And amongst their other problems uh, was uh, this, King Charles II of Spain was the uh, consequence of Habsburgs, uh, the, uh, the, the royal family, marrying their cousins for uh, generations. And he had uh, physical and mental uh, disabilities. And the key question in, in Europe at that time was what was going to happen uh, to Spain 
after him, because if we uh, take a quick look at this map, we can see uh, Spain uh, at the bottom and the Spanish monarchy extends into southern Italy. Of course, they also have uh, uh, the Spanish Netherlands and other possessions, and of course, the um, Americas. Um, France was the uh, rising power, of course, the Dutch and the English were also challenging the French. If the uh, French were to get control of the Spanish Empire, then they would be invincible. So obviously the Dutch and the English didn't want that. Uh, the alternate claimants to the Spanish throne was the other branch of the Habsburg family that we can see in uh, Austria, the sort of mustard colour, um, more or less in the, uh, the centre right of the screen. And of course, if the Austrian Habsburgs acquired the uh, Spanish Habsburg throne, then France found it would find itself um, surrounded on all sides, which uh, they, they didn't want either. And so what, uh, what happened was that King Louis XIV uh, managed to marry one of his uh, granddaughters uh, to Charles II. Um, so this essentially was to get the French foot uh, in the door. Unfortunately, uh, Charles II was unable uh, to father children, but this marriage formed the, uh, the backdrop of the, uh, the Alto de Fe that we're going to look at in uh, 1680. Uh, and the Alto de Fe uh, took place here in Madrid's uh, very beautiful Plaza Mayor. Um, and uh, it was actually the, the second large Alta de Fe that had been held in Madrid. The previous one was uh, in 1632, when Spain was uh, still a great power. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a historian, I, I, I will stand corrected, but it seems to me that uh, a large part of the purpose of this Alta de Fe in uh, 1680 was to say to the French and to other powers, you know, Spain might have lost Portugal, it might have had some defeats, but it was still a, a great European uh, power. And um, it, uh, it, it took quite a, quite a lot of planning to have such a, a, an alter de fe on, on such grand scale. Um, as, as we can see here, they had to bring in carpenters and they sort of built up um, stands on either side. It's a bit like a, a sort of football stadium in a way. They also built uh, an altar um, in the middle and uh, fitted out the balconies so that uh, the grand, Grandes of the Spania, the sort of VIPs, could, uh, could watch. Um, now, of course, most uh, auto de fe were not um, such uh, grand affairs, but um, from the Catholic uh, theological perspective, what, what is going on here is, is perhaps summarized by this uh, painting of the Last Judgment, where in um, Catholic belief, uh, Jesus will return to the earth, he will uh, raise the dead, and he will judge between the good and the evil, sending the, uh, the good to heaven and the uh, evil uh, to hell. And, and the, the Inquisition, uh, you know, we might think it was about power or money or something else, but from a theological point of view, they, they, they thought that almost they were reflecting um, God's, God's work on earth. Um, now, of course, uh, most Alta de Fe were not particularly uh, grand. Uh, they, they were uh, known as uh, Altos Particular, and when a, a local tribunal, the, the Inquisition was divided into regional tribunals with uh, a suprema, the sort of head office, as it were, in the center. This was moved permanently uh, to Madrid in uh, 1640. Um, but if a local tribunal had, you know, a few people that they had to bring to an auto de fe uh, for judgment, they would often hold it in a, in a church or a monastery, you know, quite often a, a Dominican one. And, and this one um, I, I've visited, it's the, uh, the Church of Santa Ana in uh, Seville. And uh, my, my own ancestor had his auto de fe here in uh, 1698, a few years after the grand one, but his brother and sister-in-law um, were at the grand one. And, and it was sort of better if, if you were going to be in an auto de fe, uh, not that you had a choice, it was probably better 
to be at one of these smaller ones because you weren't uh, paraded through the street having some rotten vegetables and things thrown at you and uh, having a, a public uh, humiliation. But um, this, this is a, a painting from Goya um, about 120 years later. Um, showing uh, again an altar de fe and you can see this is in a church but it's it's still packed and still presumably highly unpleasant uh for for the prisoners so um i mentioned that uh, my own uh, ancestor was at an uh, at a, uh, an alto in uh, seville and this is one of the documents which the uh, seville tribunal uh, sent to the uh, Suprema uh, in Madrid, and it survives in the archives there. Um, if we look a bit uh, closer, this is um, a high quality uh, document. It is relatively good handwriting, well preserved, easy to read. And if we just have a quick look, we can see sort of Don Antonio de Mendoza, alias Juan Antonio de Castro y Mendoza, natural born in the city of uh, Jayen, resident in this uh, of this is an abbreviation for seville they use a lot of uh, abbreviations uh, of the age of uh, 43 and the officio of the uh, profession maestro de armas so he uh, he taught sword fighting he was uh, a master at arms uh, fencing teacher uh, alto so he's tall uh, the buen cuerpo, good, good body, uh, and then we'll we'll skip the bit where it goes on about his yellow um, yellow eyes. Um, so uh, we, we we saw at the beginning a, a document published, uh, a book published in England, which is just attacking the Inquisition, and the the propaganda war worked in both ways. And what we're looking at now is a uh, I suppose we could call it a souvenir brochure. Uh, produced um, sort of describing what happened at this uh, altar de fe and you can see here on the third line it says it's it's celebrated and it, it was it was a religious occasion a political occasion and probably also a a social occasion so let us close in on the actual altar de fe itself so two days before it happened the uh, captain of the guard, that's to say the guy who was in charge of uh, security uh, for the event, he, he met his men by the um, old uh, city walls of Madrid, by the Alcala Gate, and um, checked that they had um, enough wood for uh, burning um, those who were going to be uh, burnt. And then he, he, he took a, a bundle of this uh, wood and he went up to the uh, old royal palace and uh, there he met with the uh, Duke of Pastrana who was a, a grandee of Spain, one of the uh, senior aristocrats. And uh, the Duke uh, took the uh, wood uh, from the captain and he uh, took it to the king and the king then uh, showed it to his uh, unfortunate uh, bride, uh, possibly explaining what it was for. Uh, reportedly, he, he returned the wood to the uh, Duke of Pastrana saying to put it on the pyre with his blessing. We, we don't actually know that this is the case. As I say, he had various uh, physical and uh, mental disabilities, but that's certainly what the, uh, the Spanish propaganda says. And the uh, Duke of Pastrana then uh, gave it uh, back to the captain and uh, sent him on his way. And so then we move to the day before the Alto de Fe, where we have the uh, procession of the Green Cross, and there is also a procession of the White Cross. And these started uh, from the headquarters of the uh, Inquisition. That building was destroyed uh, in the 19th century. All that survives now is part of the uh, cellars, which of course could have been uh, uh, their cells. And uh, rather, rather oddly, that is today a cocktail, uh, a cocktail bar. So um, the uh, procession of the Green Cross uh, started at the uh, cocktail bar. It was led by a uh, senior figure within the Dominican order carrying a green cross. 
and it included uh, the, the people who were to appear in the auto de fe, uh, the uh, bones of, of some of those who had, uh, had died before the auto de fe, uh, some guards and members of various uh, religious orders and um, military orders and so forth. And they went uh, from the Inquisition headquarters to the uh, Plaza Mayor where the auto de fe was to be held and they put the green cross next to the high altar that had been built there and they then put a black uh, cloth over it and it was watched overnight by Dominican uh, monks. Meanwhile the uh, procession of the white cross headed up to where the, uh, the uh, prisoners who were to be burnt were to be burnt so it was just basically going there to uh, organize everything. After the procession of the Green Cross had arrived at the Plaza Mayor, of course, the uh, prisoners were, were held um, overnight nearby. And so we arrive, uh, sorry, uh, first of all, uh, this is just a couple of, of pictures from, uh, actually this is Holy Week in Seville, but maybe it gives a, a slight feeling of, uh, of, of, of what the atmosphere um, would have been like. And so um, I think we should also say that uh, this was, uh, generally speaking, they like to have a very uh, dignified um, event, but uh, people were very status oriented. So in the earlier Alto de Fe, the uh, Franciscans uh, pictured on, on the left in the uh, brown cassocks were upset that the uh, Dominicans in the uh, black cassocks had given them too lowly a position within the, uh, the uh, parade of the Green Cross and they then went off in a strop uh, back to their monastery. But on, on this occasion everything uh, went as, uh, as planned. And so we now meet, reach the, the morning of the uh, 30th of June 1680 Generally, an auto de fe would start at about nine o'clock. The uh, prisoners and the guards would be given the, their breakfast. The uh, prisoners who were to be killed uh, would be uh, told of their fate. And then the events would start. This auto de fe was different. It had um, 120 people to be got through. So it was very, very large. And they decided to start at five o'clock in the morning instead uh, and also, generally speaking, the people to be executed would hear their sentences last, but the Inquisition liked people to be burnt uh, whilst it was still daylight. So on this day, they decided that they would give those people their, uh, their judgments at uh, 4 p.m. So um, here we see an, an image of uh, people arriving at uh, five, the king himself uh, arrived at uh, eight. Uh, because it was going to be so long, uh, food and drinks were laid on for the, uh, the VIPs. Um, and um, here is uh, a famous painting. It, it, it's by Francisco Rizzi. Uh, it's in the, uh, the Prado Museum in uh, Madrid. And uh, Rizzi was actually present at the Auto de Fe. He painted this uh, three years later. I'm not quite sure whether it was uh, for, for, for the royal household or for the Inquisition or, or, or something else, but it, it, it gives a, a good understanding of um, what, uh, what happened. The Inquisition claimed that uh, 30,000 people were there, which doesn't look like it, but maybe that includes the crowds um, on the street. If we look at the uh, center at the, and the back, we can see the uh, king and queen of Spain sitting on either side of the uh, king's mother, Maria of Austria, who was the uh, regent because the king was uh, not really um, capable. And again, if we, we look at the big picture, if you look on the the right hand side where you can see the, the red and the white. Uh, if, if we go more closely, you can see that these are people wearing uh, San Benito's, a special smock they had to wear, uh, and those with uh, flames going up were those who were to be 
um, killed. On either side of them, you can see others in um, yellow uh, San Benitos with red uh, St. Andrew's crosses on. And these are the people who have been uh, reconciled. And almost nobody was ever found uh, innocent, although it did happen on occasion. But generally speaking, people would admit uh, some sort of wrongdoing. They would uh, accept their punishment. They would have their property confiscated and they would live. And uh, that's sort of how it would work. And we have to remember, of course, this was uh, as well as a, a state occasion and a, a spectacle. It was a religious event as well. And so uh, a sermon was preached by a, a senior figure in the Dominican order. On this occasion, his sermon uh, took the theme of the uh, motto of the Inquisition, Arise, O God, plead thine own cause, which, uh, I, again, thinking back to the Last Judgment, uh, this, this is uh, how they uh, perceived it. And, and there was a lot of um, extremely beautiful music, it has to be said, although probably um, if you're one of the prisoners, you weren't uh, of a mind to appreciate it. And, and this in the center shows the, the prisoners. They were brought up uh, two by two. You can see them in the center in their San Benitos. And two of the uh, clerks of the Inquisition on either side would uh, read their, um, their, their judgments, what was gonna happen uh, to them. The um, a French, reportedly a, a French source, I suspect this is not actually true, um, said that a, a beautiful young uh, Jewish girl cried out for mercy to the queen who, who wasn't, of course, able to do anything. And, and she was quite upset and she actually uh, developed an eating disorder, I shouldn't laugh. She developed an eating disorder and um, died uh, relatively young. It, it must have been awful because she came from you know, the Enlightenment court of, of Versailles into this sort of almost medieval um, situation. So the um, prisoners to be burnt were uh, taken away early so it could be done um, in, uh, in daylight. They were actually, this was not done by the Inquisition, this was uh, relaxed to the secular authorities. And in this image we can see the, uh, the guards uh, taking, taking some people away. Um, in this one, again, I, this is uh, a painting by Goya. Again, I, I love, Goya's my favorite um, artist. This is obviously you know, 120 years later, but uh, I think it, it just shows the, 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 the atmosphere and the sheer nastiness and uh, horror of, of, of the situation. So those people to be burnt, uh, and actually there were 20 because at the Auto de Fe, 30 people were, were only there in effigy, that's to say they had escaped or, or hadn't been caught, and another three had died. Sorry David, can you explain in effigy, what's that? Oh, okay, um, basically uh, the, the court had, uh, had judged them guilty, but they didn't actually have their, their corporeal presence. Um, you know, they, they, they physically might have been sitting in Amsterdam or London or, or just Portugal or, or, or wherever. So they, um, my understanding, again, I, I, I will be corrected, but a, a, a cutout uh, was, was burnt of them. And, and a few years earlier in, in, in Cordova, I think, uh, there's a case of somebody actually watching himself being burnt in effigy, which must have been um, quite, um, quite odd. Um, but the, the, the burning place uh, in, uh, in, in Madrid is now just has a, a sort of municipal um, fountain. Um, 20 people were burnt alive. Anybody who uh, wanted to be reconciled at the last minute uh, could be uh, garroted uh, before they were burnt alive so that they would already be dead uh, when they were burnt. And uh, 19 of the uh, 20 people, we, we would say murdered, uh, uh, that's obviously our, our, our opinion. Uh, 19 of those were accused of uh, Judaizing and one uh, was accused of being a Muslim. Um, to go back to the uh, people who were uh, reconciled 
to the Catholic Church. Um, what, what happened to them is, is they were, had to answer uh, 14 questions. Basically, I think it's the Catholic uh, catechism. You know, do you believe in the Trinity? Yes, I believe, and, and so forth. And at the end of this, they were ceremonially uh, forgiven the uh, black um, cloth over the green cross was uh, removed, candles were lit, and uh, prayers uh, were made. But um, this wasn't the end of it, because they were then sent into uh, what <laughs> was in the Soviet Union would have been called internal exile. So that they had to leave uh, Madrid, they couldn't go back to their uh, towns of origin, and they were not allowed within uh, 12 miles of the sea or the border. I, I mentioned that uh, some of my own kinsmen uh, were there. And so if you look at number 61, this is uh, Juan de Castro y Torres, who was the uh, brother of my uh, direct ancestor. And if you look at the second line, he says, uh, it says, originario de Portugal. So this guy, he was born in Spain, but they're still saying he's of Portuguese origin. That's to say, you know, he's of unclean blood, he's not, not really one of us. Um, below his wife, uh, Ana Maria de Orobio, uh, who was also uh, a Navarro, which I suspect might be the uh, Navarro family we, we, we have in London now. Um, if we look at number 63 at the top of the other um, second column, we see Ana Maria's uh, brother, Antonio de Orobio, uh, alias Antonio de Hinosa, alias Antonio Navarro. And this guy, actually, he escaped from Spain. He went to Portugal, where he was caught by the uh, Portuguese Inquisition and burnt alive. Um, also, actually, Juan and Ana Maria's youngest uh, child, Miguel, he was uh, arrested uh, by the Inquisition near São Paulo in Brazil and taken back to Lisbon, uh, where he was uh, burnt alive. And I think um, we should just say that the, the people who, who, who were burnt at the Inquisition uh, on this occasion, one of them was born in Bordeaux, another in uh, Livorno, another in Pisa, another had been living in Pero Horade, just on the French side of the Pyrenees. And these people had come to Spain. So I think many Jews see the Inquisition perhaps a bit like the Tsar and uh, his Cossacks, that everybody was running away, but there was traffic in, in both directions. And I would also say that, you know, sometimes uh, historians can be a bit uh, stuffy towards uh, genealogists. But from the gene genealogical point of view, we can start to see the actual movements of, of the population, so that my family were in Jayen and their cousins were in Malaga, and obviously they had family uh, over, over uh, southern Spain. But lots of um, trails seem to lead back to the uh, northeast of uh, Portugal. I've highlighted uh, Mogadouro and uh, Vila Flor, but we could e equally say uh, Braganza and um, other, other cities. So my um, direct ancestor, uh, my ancestor's brother and his wife, I, I beg your pardon, were sent from Madrid to uh, Valladolid. Uh, presumably, they, they took the northern road, so presumably they had to walk past uh, where their friends had been uh, burnt alive. And um, they, they settled in, in Valladolid, where they uh, started a family, uh, most of whom uh, later, uh, somehow or another, we haven't yet worked out how, uh, managed to uh, to leave Spain, uh, and some went to uh, Amsterdam. This is the uh, the Portuguese synagogue of Amsterdam, and then of course others uh, eventually uh, made their way to London. Uh, this is my own synagogue, uh, Bevis Marks. That's our, our senior rabbi uh, Joseph Dweck talking to the congregation, and. Um, the Sephardic story uh, obviously uh, continues, but I think if, if we can just take two thoughts from this. The first is that the Inquisition, whatever we might think of it, it was a legal process. It was an ecclesiastical court of the church which worked to rules 
and which kept records. And if we can understand it through that, yes, it functioned differently in different places at different times, but if we can understand it on its own terms rather than just as some uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy or whatever, we can learn much more about it. I think uh, about our own uh, ancestors and our own history. And I think also that um, if we better understand what was going on in the uh, late 17th century, early uh, 18th century, uh, it makes much more sense. Uh, a lot of the uh, Western Sephardim, they were born in one country, married in the second and, and buried in the third. And, and I think if, if we place them within the historic context, we, uh, we, 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 we learn much more. So um, I'm afraid I've, 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 I've talked for a bit too uh, long. So, so let me uh, have my water and hand over to, to Ton. Uh, thank you, David, for a most interesting talk. Um, before uh, I will uh, allow questions, just a short look ahead. We will talk with Daniela Weil in a week, same time, uh, about Dutch Brazil and the first Jews of New York. And we will also talk about Daniela Weil's new book, Asa Levy, one of those who left Brazil for uh, New York. You can sponsor a meeting or you can support us at Patreon, so we will be able to recover our costs in the future. I will um, now give you the opportunity to unmute yourself and to ask uh, questions. Questions, anyone? Um, are, are there questions uh, in the, uh, the chat or, or indeed comments? Yes. Uh, do you know if a copy of the processors around the world was sent to the Vatican at some point? Presumably uh, someone is hoping that uh, the records will be kept in the Vatican. I doubt it. I, in fact, I'm sure not because it was under royal authority uh, in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think what we can say is it's generally been believed that um, the most of the Spanish processos uh, have been lost, while obviously the, the most of the Portuguese ones uh, survive. There are a large number of uh, processos uh, in Madrid, which haven't even been indexed. Well, when I say a large number, this is what I've been told. Um, so, so hopefully we can, uh, we can uh, start to uncover um, some more information. And also various libraries around the world have, uh, have, have copies. What, what happened is, is Napoleon, when he invaded Spain in whatever it was, 1809, 1808. Um, he, he was interested in the Inquisition, so carted all their records um, back to, uh, to Paris. And uh, then at the end of the uh, Napoleonic Wars, they were brought back to uh, Madrid. And a lot of these were, were lost um, in, on the journey in, in both directions. And then, of course, in the various civil wars and whatever in Spain, more, yet more documents have been lost. Um. Would you be able and willing to do a lecture on an auto da fe that took place outside of Spain, Portugal or New Mexico? Well, we 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 have been discussing this. There was the um, there there is one actually in um, is one there was one in in, in Mexico, uh, which somebody has uh, completely translated into English, and maybe maybe that would be a, 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 a useful one to look at. Because the, these Inquisition processors, they did, there was literally, I mean, I showed, indeed I showed a picture of, there was literally a handbook uh, uh, as, as to how, how, how to run your, your tribunal. And so they did follow a, a pretty fixed uh, format, including a genealogical se uh, section. Now, obviously, some people would, uh, withhold information or provide uh, false information. But I think, I think where we are now, as a lot of these documents start to be uh, digitized, is, is, you know, with a lot of us now interested in the subject, we can probably start to, uh, to get, uh, get more information from them. 
1679, uh, there was a plague in Europe. Was there a connection between this plague and uh, the auto da fe of 1680? Like maybe sort of uh, um, a penitence from the side of the Spanish? I, the honest answer is I don't know. Mm. I would think probably not because the Inquisition is, is going through various judicial processes and also the given reason for having the Alto de Fe was the celebration of the nuptials of um, Charles II and uh, Marie Louise. Um, mm. So, but I, I, I don't know. Also, it would make sense to be socially, socially distancing rather than uh, bringing crowds together for an Alto de Fe. But I don't know, maybe, maybe somebody else has the answer. Okay, so questions, Adiom? I might also add, if you're interested in an overall view of the Inquisition, Henry Cammon's book on the Spanish Inquisition, the history of it, is a good background, not emphasizing just the Sephardic Jewish, although it's a majority of it, but rather the whole institution and its functioning, when it was created, the decrees that were involved in finally its dissolution in the 1830s. Could I ask a question? Can you hear me? Sorry, can I, can I, yes, I can. Can I, can I just jump in with that? Because there, there is a whole sort of historiography of the Inquisition, rather perhaps depending on, on one's politics. So that, for example, the, the father of the current uh, Israeli Prime Minister, uh, Ben Sion Netanyahu, uh, was a, a famous historian who took a uh, somewhat revisionist uh, position. He, he actually, in his time, was Jabotinsky's uh, secretary uh, and his view I mean I, I, I simplify but it was more or less it was a lot of anti-Semites doing what uh, anti-Semites do whereas you can go to the other extreme where you have Catholic apologists who saying well not really many people died and they weren't killed by the church and it was all okay but um, now I, 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 I hear you and I, th I think it is very useful to um, to, uh, to, to look at sources. One, one source which is, is available free online, it's a, it's a bit old, is uh, Henry Lee's uh, three volume uh, history of the Inquisition. But um, yeah. That, so, so, so it's a heavy read. It's a good book, but it's a, a long read to read through it. It surely is, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, Francis, you had a question. Yes. I've read some stuff about the socio-economic background of, 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 of the expulsions and the Inquisition, about the economy of Spain and Portugal, the economy of Spain, and the issues of where the Muslims and the Jews actually worked together before 1492, and then did and then didn't. But I'm just wondering what the socio-economic background is, because it has been said that the Spanish were trying to grab control of their entire economy, which I don't think was simply said because they said all the Jews are rich and the is poor, no. But is there a thread there which is rarely talked about? I am not a historian. I can say what I, I suspect. I suspect that the, uh, they were mercantilist economics, sort of how they saw it, you know, get the gold, plus for us is minus uh, for you. But I, I don't think the Inquisition was actually interested in the uh, financial aspects. The, the Inquisition itself, it survived off what it confiscated. So it had an interest in going after wealthy people. I think, you know, on various occasions, Spain went bankrupt. Uh, and on one occasion, one of the financiers who was trying to help Spain out of bankruptcy was himself um, arrested. So uh, I, th I think I think I think it's a you know a very complicated question. Perhaps I'm not the best qualified person to uh, to answer it. But as I would see it, the the Inquisition themselves were more interested in in souls, uh, saving souls, and perhaps uh, funding themselves than in the economic well-being of the Spanish Empire. 
what was the Spanish government's position? Or and I've read stuff which says that the Jews left, they went back, they left again, that it was not a simple expulsion. Again, I'd have to remember where I picked all this up. Well, I mean, clear, clearly it was a two-way street because we, we have, just at that Alta de Fe, we have four, we know four people at least who had come from other countries to Spain, which, which, which say it probably, you know, you, you wouldn't have traveled from, from Britain to, uh, to Poland if you were Jewish in 1941 or, you know, mm -hmm. if you were anybody. Um, so uh, I, 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 I think... You know, part, part, part of what Ton and I are, are hoping to do here, and we, you know, we, we are not uh, um, historians, uh, it, it is especially towards the, um, the Jewish audience, is to um, throw out the thought that things are a bit more complicated and less black and white than we might uh, imagine. Uh, I'm not going to say that we should uh, forgive or forget uh, what the Inquisition did, because I think perhaps in, in the views of a lot of people then it was uh, barbaric, as we said though, that the English were, were burning witches at the same time. So, um, yeah, if, it is uh, what it is. If I may jump in here, um, we must remember that Spain uh, consisted of a series of kingdoms which yeah. gradually evolved into one kingdom. Yeah, yeah. There were all kinds of regions, uh, some more powerful, some less powerful, with uh, nobles who had positions of power. And the king and queen of Spain did not really have a power base in, uh, of themselves. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they used the Inquisition as one of the means to unify the, the whole kingdom and to get everyone uh, involved at the same level. Can I just jump for one second? Yes. Thank you. Um, the Jews at the time of the Black Plague, as of today, they always kept a completely different hygiene uses. They washed their hands. They actually tried to keep a non a pork and all the non-kosher food outside of their diet. And it is proven that at that time, it helped. I don't want to say that they were immune to the Black Plague, but it was a lot of Jews at that time that they managed to survive. I can still remember my grandmother talking about the Black Plague from family to family went through. So that created a kind of uh, mystery, a kind of jealousy, from the non-Jews to why they were surviving. And correct me if I'm wrong, David, that might be one of the consequences as well for these persecutions, besides the economic, as you mentioned before, when a new Christian was born, they actually told them that he had to leave their town or the areas that they were living at. So who took care about all these positions that they had at that time? I think it's very, very complicated. Um, I think in terms of hygiene, again, I'm afraid I, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, Muslims also have um, a, uh, a sort of hygienic uh, regime. Um, I, I wonder how clean, frankly, all the Jews were at that, um, that stage. Uh, so I, I, I'm afraid I... I don't, I don't, I don't know. We, I don't know. We there? have to remember that... Uh, anti-Semitism uh, predated the Black, the black Plague. Yeah, it uh, has been there from before uh, the beginning of, uh, of yeah, beginning of our era, before uh, 0 BC. Mm -hmm. And it has always been there, and the church uh, developed um, a lot of uh, anti-Jewish uh, decrees also before 1350. If I just make very quick, just to tell you an edit. My grandmother's last name is Moreno. And it sounds like, you know, Moreno, the color Moreno. And she always told me that the reason of the name Moreno that they took, it doesn't come from the color itself. It's from the Hebrew. That means More, that is teacher. Anu, our teacher. 
But the people they didn't understand why Moreno came and they managed to continue in that way. <laughs> I think it's a nice story. I mean, who knows though? Yeah. Can I ask a question about the other Catholic inquisitions so in places like Venice or Brazil or what was going on? Is there somewhere where we can actually find almost a side-by-side -side guide to um, inquisitions we've known and loved? Um, uh, you know, what was happening in Turkey, what was happening in the Middle East, um, because I read bits, but I haven't been able to connect them together. There's the whole question of the Caribbean, where a lot of Jews had arrived before the Inquisition um, was really established and were driven out at some point. Sometimes I read as a result of the arrival of the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisitions. Um, but trying to get an overall picture of these um, is difficult. And I wondered if you either know of a source or if somebody could do a presentation on them. I, I think that's probably about 50, uh, 50 presentations. <laughs> but um, just, just to actually, because um, on one of the points, for example, in Mexico, uh, when the, uh, the uh, Spanish Inquisition were rounding up people in, in whenever it was, about 1650, my impression is that a lot of them, their, their principal crime was that they were Portuguese. Uh, rather than they were new Christians, and this this made them sort of enemy uh, enemy citizens. Um, but in terms of uh, Inquisition, we have the obviously the the Spanish Inquisition and its various uh, tribunals and, and and parts, of course, including uh, in the New World, some of which, of course, the the, uh, the, uh, the archives were destroyed, and the uh, Portuguese Inquisition would. Bring, my impression is they would bring people back from Brazil, but of course there was an autonomous uh, branch uh, branch office in uh, in Goa. Um, um, yes, may I've I come in? It. Yes. Um, I think one of the things we have to remember is that there are all sorts of different, as you've explained, uh, ideas. Uh, in Jamaica, for example, in the, the under the Spanish, no new Christian was allowed in Jamaica, but we allowed Portugals to come in. And we estimate that those Portugals were in fact new Christians. So yes. it was a way of describing people who Spain would accept because of the so-called nationality, but not their religion. And we have no evidence that they really practiced Judaism, yes. at least certainly until the English captured Jamaica in 1655. And then after that, we had no problem in allowing Jews to enter Jamaica, and they practiced Judaism. In fact, our earliest grave is 1672. And then we have the problem, of course, is in the rest of the Caribbean or other aspects of the Caribbean is where the Catholic Church was strong, inquisitions took place. And certainly that's true of many of the Eastern Caribbean islands. And I've even been as far as Lima to look into the prison in which Jews were held prior to the inquisition prior to the author de fe. So yes, it's as you quite rightly identified, every island, every country, every town even has its own story. But the real question I come back to Ton is, after the reconquista of Granada, didn't Spain really come, become one country? And because you mentioned that there were, of course, many different regions in Spain. But I, I was of the impression that Spain became a more cohesive organized, or, or ten territory than than uh, than than it had been with the Christian and the Muslims re, 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 ruling in different parts. Yes, uh, it gradually became more centralized and more unified, with uh, one government, one court, uh, one king, etc. But this was a gradual process which took many years and the kings of Spain took advantage of the Inquisition to, um, to have another um, instrument of power over the population. I mean, I think it's also worth adding that um, often Castilians would be upset by Aragonese going to the uh, Americas, which they felt was uh, Castilian uh, 
territory. And uh, I, I mean, my understanding, and again, I, I have to say I'm, I'm not a historian, but that centralization really happened after uh, Charles, the, uh, after Charles II uh, died and the, the Bourbons uh, then took Quite a long time afterwards. The final step in centralization really doesn't come place until 1714 with the, um, the final civil war at that time when Catalonia, yeah. Aragon is forced to become part of, not they're already part of the crown, but they're directly controlled. And so that is until 1714, yeah. uh, at the end of the, the Carlist War at that point. So you've got a gradual situation. And the edicts about them not coming to the New World are not revoked until the late 1700s. Because the, um, some of the Catalan regiment that's in California during the early years in San Diego and North, in the 1790s and 18, early 1800s, uh, are some of the first Catalans who were allowed into the New World after the uh, release of that, the lifting of that decree. So you've got a gradual process of that unification. But not until 1714 do you have direct political control the crown over those areas in a single institution, single parliament in Madrid, and that's when Barcelona begins to suffer. And part of what we're seeing today is a response to that, those actions that were taken then as Barcelona wants to now separate out and re restore its cultural and historical period yeah. situation. Okay. Uh, I would like to add, please, another aspect, please. Sure. Yes. Hi, this is Uri. Uh, from what we know, uh, Izmir, which is, was then in the Ottoman Empire, Smyrna, was a place where uh, Portuguese Moranos uh, arrived to return to Judaism. The famous one was Dona Gracia Senor and her uncle Yosef Nasi. And uh, there was a synagogue, there is a synagogue in Izmir by the name of Portugal. Yes. Very interesting because those who returned to Judaism had some kind of experience in Christianity and they were very critical about the Jewish establishment of Izmir. And it says that the Shabtai Tzvi started his, uh, his prophecy uh, in these communities, the Portuguese that returned to Judaism in, in, uh, in Izmir. This is a story that I can add to this. I, I, th I think, I mean, Toton is, uh, is, is looking at uh, relations between uh, certainly Amsterdam and London and, uh, and communities in the East. I, I would say before, before Ton uh, jumps in, o obviously sort of uh, Dona Gracia is sort of slightly before um, the uh, period that uh, we're, we're focused on. But I, I, I do remember seeing that the Auto de Fe in... Um, in uh, um, the the uh, people in Coimbra in um, 1640, Coimbra in in Portugal. One of the things there is is that they were apparently sending money to a uh, community in in Corfu, which I think was at that point I think within the Ottoman Empire. Um, so there's probably more connections and contacts than than we imagine. But Sir Ton is the uh, expert. <laughs> Mm, yes, there were many connections between Amsterdam and, uh, well, the wider Sephardic world. Uh, one of the aspects of that is that they had a charity called Dotar, which Dotar Dao is to um, young girls and young orphans uh, throughout the known Sephardic world. And this could be as far away as Jerusalem, Constantinople, Corfu, or New York, or for a very short time, Recife and Brazil. Uh, another aspect is that Amsterdam had, a, well, uh, the Amsterdam community was relatively rich, and many people uh, went to Amsterdam when in need. Uh, not only individual people, but uh, from Jerusalem and Izmir, 
there were uh, shark yachts sent to Amsterdam and throughout the whole of Europe, also to London, to Bordeaux, to collect money. And the third aspect of this relation between Amsterdam and the wider Sephardic world is that Amsterdam sent its poor away to other countries and gave them some money for, uh, um, for the journey and often also some money to start a new life elsewhere. And uh, these people were also uh, spread across the world, also from Izmir and Jerusalem to New York, to Brazil, to Curaçao, to Suriname, to Jamaica. And another aspect is that a lot of Amsterdam Sephardim, although they are called Portuguese Jews, uh, came from elsewhere than Portugal, from Spain, from France, from Italy, from Constantinople, from Turkey, from Jerusalem, and from elsewhere. So um, Amsterdam was a kind of a, a center, a, a Jerusalem of the north, as they said. But, 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 Ton, Amsterdam only becomes a center for Judaism after the Reformation. So the whole change in Europe becomes a change from Catholicism to allow Jews to settle, which happens also in England. And, and, and that, to me, is really one of the major changes of how Jews were able to continue to exist over the last 300 years. Uh, yes. I don't think, I don't think, I, I mean, you know, one of the fascinating stories, I don't know if anybody has read it, Jeannie, Jeannie um, Milgram's book, My 15 Grandmothers, when she was born in Cuba, of what became from her own research a my Jewish uh, family that settled in, 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 in or was converted, became a, a, a conversion family, converso family, and she was able to trace her ancestry back 15 generations to Spain. In Cuba, they did not have apparently an inquisition, but they did have a significant number of conversos. So it becomes a fascinating story because they were always Spanish until they, until they were liberated, if you wish, by the Americans. And as far as I understand, um, Jeannie Milgram's family emigrated relatively late to Cuba. Yes, relatively late. Yeah. The 19th century. That means that we must have been conversos in Spain already absolutely uh, during a long time but i don't know if they always identified themselves as conversos i don't think they would have been allowed to to be able to stay in that country or any country we, we don't even know if they knew the home to portugal so so sorry phyllis i didn't hear um, her family went to Portugal from Spain at some point. Um, I seem to remember, yes, um, uh, oh, because obviously she, she, she used a, a, a superb genealogist. Um, I, I, I seem to remember they were in the, the, t the, the village of Fermoseli, which was just mm -hmm. on the Spanish side of the, uh, the, the Portuguese border. And presumably, like uh, as, as, as we were discussing before, that that part of the world seems to be very uh, very full of new Christians. Right. Shall we, um, Tom? Do you want to wind up? They they've given us extra time yes. because it's Mother's Day in uh, in the Netherlands. Um, but, uh, yes, um, we will try to answer uh, the other questions. Uh, in the chat. Ask a, a, a little question. Point. Because um, of you, I'd Gina, just, yeah. I'd, uh, I'd just like to know whether the form of punishment that they used at the auto de fe was exclusive to that, or did they use those sort of punishments for their own criminals? Was yeah. it just reserved for Jews and Muslims? They burn lots of heretics. All, 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 all varieties of, of, of heretics. Um, so you could be a uh, some sort of form of, of Protestant. You could be uh, you could be gay. You could be 
Uh, well, witches, they weren't, I mean, I think they did burn a couple of witches, but they weren't that uh, believing in, in, in that sort of stuff. So it, it was about sort of heresy. And we have to remember, they were pretty bloody times. I mean, as, as you know, we, 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 we said before, in, in England, they were sort of busy burning witches and, uh, you know, doing equivalents across sort of Germany and France and everywhere else. So I, I, I think it's perhaps a bit unfair to, uh, to accuse the the Inquisition of being uniquely bloody. I think perhaps what is perhaps especially to modernize is, is how it was sort of an institutionalized um, way of doing it. Like, uh, like, well, I suppose you shouldn't really make comparisons to Hitler and Stalin, but, but that yeah. sort of, almost, well, not industrial, but um, ideological. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um... We shall end the meeting then, and we hope to see you next week when uh, Daniela Bell will uh, be speaking about uh, Brazil, Dutch Brazil and the first Jews in New York. Bye all, and thank you for watching. Thank, thank you. you. Many thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.